Hello, everyone. So as you heard, my name is Mark Dalglish. I'm here all the way from Melbourne, Australia, which means right now is actually my bedtime. Just if anything happens, that's why. Uh, I'm here today to put it to you that the lines between libraries and frameworks are blurring. I want to explain to you how this is happening and why I think this is important. So first, a bit of background. I've been working in the React space quite actively, as I'm sure many of you are aware. Uh, I've been working in the React space for about uh, 10 plus years now. And that work has led me to my full-time position now, working on the Remix team, which I'm very fortunate to be able to do and be here today to talk to you about some of my experiences there. Now, if you go to the React docs today and you look at how do I start a new project, they address this distinction of libraries versus frameworks right up front because they, ask the question, they answer the question, can I use React without a framework, implying, of course, React is a library. And they say, of course, you can use it without a framework. It is a library. Uh, but they recommend that you do, in fact, use a framework. Because of that, there's a bunch of frameworks out there right now that you can use, uh, Remix, of course, being one of them, but it's by far not the only one. A lot of great work being done on top of React. And here we see the separation between the UI library being React and the frameworks that sit on top. You see the same distinction happening in the world of routing, which is, of course, where Remix sits. We have React Router, which has been a staple of the React community pretty much since the beginning. I've been using it since my earliest days of using React. And that's reflected in this download chart, where you can see about half of all React installs are coupled with React Router, pretty impressive numbers. If you look at the readme for React Router, you can see that it describes itself as a lightweight, fully featured routing library. So obviously, we have a library here. But then we also have Remix, which is a full stack web framework, as described here. So what's interesting for the purposes of the talk today is that Remix, the framework, is actually built on top of React Router. In fact, if you go and look at the source code for Remix Run React, one of the uh, most prolific packages that you use within the project, you'll see that it starts off right at the top with a bunch of re-exports re from React Router. So if you're familiar with React Router APIs, you feel right at home with React Router. We've pretty much described it as React Router, the framework, for this exact reason. So here, again, we have this distinction between the library, in this case, a routing library, and on top, we have the web framework. So given this distinction we're trying to drill into today, what makes Remix feel like a framework? Well, right up front, to me, the thing that most notably makes it feel like a framework is it's really the entry point to your entire dev and build cycle. From the CLI, you say, Remix, start my dev environment. Remix, start my build. You see this reflected in the fact that there's a dedicated config file in your project, remix.config.js, sitting there, and it's, just, it's helping you configure this entire dev and build process. So again, Remix is owning the whole life cycle here. It's also reflected in the fact that your project structure, the way files sit on disk, is dictated by the framework. Now, out of the box, uh, Remix has opinions, but it is pretty configurable. So in that sense, it's uh, slightly less frameworky than it appears. But still, frameworks do tend to care, care about the way your files sit on disk. The other big thing, which is really the focus of the talk today as well, is that Remix owns the bundler. The bundler, of course, being the piece of the puzzle that says, how do I convert my source code into something that runs in the browser, on the server, or both? Which, obviously, in the case of Remix, being full stack, it targets both. Now, Remix, uh, for quite a while now, had been built on top of ES Build. And if you look at the documentation for ES Build, you can see why. Uh, its big calling card was the fact that it's extremely fast, uh, a lot faster than a lot of the alternatives that we were using at the time of ES Build's release. And so that was a really nice uh, benefit for Remix consumers that Remix was able to swap out at the time, swap out from using Rollup to using ES Build. That meant that not only could Remix ship with the inbuilt uh, features that ES Build supported, but given that ES Build has a plugin system, we were able to add a bunch of features on top. So of course, you get things like TypeScript, static asset handling, CSS, MDX. Uh, some notable omissions in ES Build that we added was um, hot module reloading, as well as browser node polyfills. A lot of work involved in man managing all of this. And uh, long story short, I could do a whole talk on this one slide. Owning the bundler is really hard. And it's kind of outside the scope of what people are trying to achieve when they're starting a framework. They're not necessarily trying to create a bundler or own a bundler at the same time. While at the same time, consumers of the framework want low-level control over the bundler. There's always some edge case or some requirement or new, some, some new library or bundler plugin that people want to use. So it's kind of like an endless list of requirements that come up that are tangential to what the framework was trying to solve. 
We had this coming from the community as well, particularly before we shipped hot module reloading, people were asking us to please consider using Vite. And uh, it, it took us a while, really, I, I have to admit, to catch up to the same realization that when we saw how much work was going into maintaining our own custom layer on top of ES Build, we hit this inevitable question of, why don't we just use Vite? So in October last year, we announced that we indeed were going to do this. We shipped an unstable version of a new uh, Vite plugin for Remix, allowing consumers to opt into this experimental new mode where instead of using ISBuild, we're going to use Vite instead. Now, if you're not familiar with Vite, although I'm sure most of you are, it presents itself as next generation front end tooling. Uh, Built on top of existing bundlers, so during development it uses ES Build and then in production it uses Rollup, or although in the future it's going to be using the Rolldown project for both. What's interesting for me and for the purposes of this talk is that Vite is, as I think of it, a platform for frameworks. If you're building a framework and you look at what Vite is doing, it's solving a lot of the problems that previously you had to take on yourself. So when we were looking into this, we said, if it's a platform for frameworks, how far could we take this philosophy? Could we even take it further than we've seen it done before? And for us, the mantra was that we wanted Remix to be just a Vite plugin. Ideally, we're just talking to Vite directly as consumers. So in our initial unstable release, it looked something like this. We had, uh, in your Vite config, you would import Vite plugin as Remix from Remix run slash dev. And this was just a regular old Vite plugin from the, from the consumer's perspective. And you would pass it into the plugins array to Vite. And so now you've essentially just told Vite, here, here's a plugin, and it's registering as a framework behind the scenes. That meant that no longer was there a dedicated config file. So remix.config.js no longer existed. And instead, we had a Vite config.ts. So as a bonus, it meant now you got type checking of your config, uh, which is really nice as a consumer. So in contrast to what we saw before, where Remix was the entry point to your entire dev and build lifecycle, now, from the command line, you would just run Vite dev, and your Remix app would start up with a local development server, hot re module reloading, everything you came to expect. And likewise, when you go, went to build, to production, build for production, you would run Vite build and Vite build SSR. Now, this drilling into this a little bit, this is one of the nice features of Vite over alternatives, which is that it has a built-in concept of whether a build is for the browser or for the server. And plugins are able to manage that differentiation for you. So here, what you're effectively doing in this, in this two-step process is you're running the build for the browser and then subsequently running the build for the server, the server-side rendering build. Well, that was the idea. So even, that was, even though that's what we shipped in our initial unstable release, and this is why it's marked as unstable, we did have to change this because we hit up against one big limitation of this model. And that is, if we go back to this command again, you can see that we're effectively hard coding the build process. We're saying, first run the browser build, and when that's finished, we're going to run the server build. But that's presuming a lot, and it's actually taking a lot of control away from the framework. Because as a framework, we need a bit more control than this. We don't want consumers to be owning this pipeline. It's kind of our business, really, as a framework. That's because, as a framework, we're going to have opinions about the number of builds. Is it just a browser build, a browser and server build? Uh, are there multiple server builds? In fact, that was the issue that we ran into. We needed to have multiple server builds, and our consumers at that time were hard coding the fact that they had a single server build. So that was a big limitation. And once you get into multiple builds, there's also the question of order of builds. We've left it up to consumers to hard code that it's browser, then server, but what if they did it in the wrong order? Or what if uh, you know, we had multiple server builds? How do we know that they're going to run those server builds in the order that we expect? It's really leaking those internal implementation details of the framework to consumers in a way that we really didn't want to do. And once you have multiple builds, of course, there needs to be some kind of communication between them. So the output of one build is going to be fed into the next. Maybe, in some cases, uh, you might find that a build will then dictate how many future builds need to be performed. And so all of this logic for coordinating the builds is something that, again, needs to be owned by the framework, not left in the hands of you as a consumer. Because at a high level, you just want to run a build. You don't really care how it's going to build. And then finally, outside of Vite as well, we may want to run some special framework-specific logic when all of the builds are completed. So in our case, that might be doing something like renaming files on disk for a particular platform, for example. That's something that's really outside of the scope of a single build. It's something that we do at the very end. So when you put all these together, what you're left with is an overarching need for some kind of build orchestration. Vite is just concerned with a single build at a time, if you're talking to it directly, and we needed something a bit more powerful than that. So when we announced that Remix Vite was going stable in February of this year, we did have to go back on this a little bit. 
I think we stayed pretty close uh, to our original goal, which is why we said that Remix is mostly just a Vite plugin. Uh, we did the build orchestration layer outside of Vite, uh, and that's why you had to still run it via the Remix CLI. So when we shipped it alongside the existing uh, bundler, that's why you have to prefix with Vite, you would say Remix Vite Dev and Remix Vite Build. So Remix Vite Dev was effectively a pass-through and just running your Vite Dev server, but it was the build step in particular where we needed to have our own custom layer sitting on top. And that layer was, again, just deciding how many builds do we need to run and then coordinating them for you behind the scenes. Luckily, Vite is a moving target, and they're always listening out for things that frameworks need, again, being that platform for frameworks. And they actually have started looking into something that solves this exact limitation. So in April this year, Patak, who's a very active member of the Vite team, uh, announced that there is a new API coming to Vite in Vite 6 called the Environment API. Now, again, I could do a whole talk just on this one slide, but what we're going to do is drill into one particular feature of the Environment API that addresses the concerns that we're talking about right now. So from this announcement, uh, the key quote here is that it says, we're introducing the concept of a Vite builder that lets frameworks orchestrate all the environment builds they need to get a single Vite build command to build the whole app. So no longer hard coding client than server, you just get one Vite build command. This means changing our stance on the framework as a plugin pattern and making it first class from Vite 6 forward. So it's worth calling out that Vite historically wasn't looking at this direction of allowing you to ship a framework as simply a Vite plugin as we were trying to do. But I'd like to think Remix did have some influence in this regard, and I'm sure other people were interested in this too. So it's really exciting to see them starting to look further in this direction. So that means, again, that no longer are we hard coding that we're running a Vite build for the browser and then a Vite build for the server. We're just going to run Vite build dash dash app, and then that's delegating to the builder behind the scenes to, to coordinate what exactly does it mean to build our application. So that build orchestration layer that we were missing before is now a core part of Vite's value proposition. To give you a high-level sense of what's going on, what this looks like, this means that you can now configure in Vite this builder, which has a build app hook. And inside of that, you get this builder instance. And most notably, you get access to builder.environments. Now, that, what that does is give you access to the configuration for how many builds we, uh, are we doing. So in, in the common case, what you're going to have here is the client build and the SSR build. So that's, that's what was built into Vite historically. Now it's much more configurable. And then what you can do is you can decide uh, programmatically what are you going to do with these different environments. So the naive case might be you just in parallel run all the builds. But in, in uh, the case of Remix, what we would be doing here, of course, is doing what you saw hard-coded earlier. We might run the browser build, then run the server build after that. Or if there's multiple server builds, we can run those multiple server builds in parallel in our case. So what's interesting here is that plugins themselves can configure Vite on your behalf, which means that plugins can define their own environments. You can be using a framework that says, I need a client build, I need a server build, I need multiple server builds. Plugins can then also define their own build steps. So once they've set up which environments they need to target, they can uh, define the logic for how exactly do we run through that build process. So now, from a framework perspective, Vite is really doing a lot for us. So Vite is giving us that bundler with sensible defaults. So earlier we talked about being built on top of ES Build. One of the great things that, from a framework perspective on, uh, for, as for us, what's great about being built on top of Vite is it gives us these sensible defaults, things like uh, support for CSS modules, for example, CSS side effect imports, things that were actually quite difficult for us to implement on top of ES Build, relatively speaking. They just come out of the box with Vite. So consumers expect them to be there and know that it'll just work, and it really just does work. But importantly, this whole thing is configurable and pluggable. So when we talked about Remix consumers wanting to be able to reach in and change specifics of how the bundler was working, now they have that ability. Vite's giving us that development environment. So when you run Vite Dev, it's spinning up uh, your app locally with hot module reloading. That's provided for us. It's giving you a preview server as well. So when you're in between Dev and Prod, you can have a look at what it might look like in production before you ship. It's giving us that build pipeline, and again, now with a configuration for exactly how that build should happen. And now they've said that framework as a plugin is now a first-class pattern, and they're looking to make sure that APIs for it are shipped in v6, and they're going to get the attention that they deserve for us as framework authors. So what's left for a framework? If Vite's doing so much work for us, what's left 
from the framework perspective. The way I think about it is that now Vite plugins get to be much more conventions as plugin. You can define what, what does it mean to have a dev environment when I run the build, what should, what should be built, where should it go on disk. Plugins can kind of own these conventions for you. But everything else is the usual library code. So from the point of view of Remix, you're going to be importing Remix APIs into your app code, as you might do any other library. So you might look at a piece of code in your app, and it looks something like this. You're importing a couple of components from Remix run slash React. But when we started going down this road, uh, it started to become inevitable for us to, to look at this and say, well, what, what does Remix even mean anymore? If we have a routing library and a bunch of conventions wrapped up in a Vite plugin, what is Remix anymore? And so we looked at this and we said, you know what? Let's just let consumers talk directly to React Router. Let's just let them use the library directly without any indirection. And all these great features that people have come to expect from Remix can just be part of the core value proposition of the library. And so at React Conf this year, we announced that, in fact, we were making the big step of taking Remix as it exists today, as you know and love, and merging it back upstream into its parent project of React Router. So everything that people love about Remix is going to be available to every single React Router consumer. Again, half of all React installs today. It's very, very exciting. Now, one way you could look at this move is to say that React Router is now a framework. And this is a totally valid position to take. I was tempted to think about it this way early on. But I naturally found myself thinking about it slightly differently. I looked at React Router and I said, you know what, to me, it's still a library. You can use it just like React. You can use it in any project with or without Vite, uh, with or without a server, uh, with or without a build step. Uh, it's still just a regular old library. Instead, I've been framing it uh, in natural conversation that React Router is a library that also has a Vite plugin. Again, shipping those conventions as a plugin if you want to, uh, if you want to use them. So conventions as a plugin, I think, is a really interesting pattern. You can ship a library, ship the conventions that are optional for the build, dev and build environment, but if you don't want to use them, you don't have to use them. So why is this important? Why am I up here talking about it? The first reason, I think, for me is, is community. Vite has been a really great community for Remix and now React Router to join. Uh, it's really lively community, great set of people working on it, and they've been really active in helping us as frameworks because I think they, they do realize they are that platform for frameworks and they need to do their part to make sure as a platform they make it easy for us, and I've really seen that happen uh, firsthand. And that's why I think you're seeing so many frameworks now being built on top of Vite. It's become something of a de facto standard to the point where if a new framework comes out tomorrow, odds are it is going to be built on Vite. And related to this is the value of simplicity that I think is arising here. Now, frameworks can be smaller. If you can just ship a Vite plugin that provides all the things that historically came from a framework, but it's just a plugin, things are a lot simpler to plug together and a lot simpler to understand. To the extent that frameworks might not even call themselves frameworks anymore. They may just be a library with a Vite plugin, as React Router is becoming in its next version. What's exciting to me, uh, and I think would be exciting for those of you here in the room, is that it means that if you want to start building a framework, there's a much lower barrier to entry than there used to be. You don't have to start off by building a CLI and wrapping a bundler and doing all of these things. You can just start writing a Vite plugin, and it gives you all the hooks you need to do what you want. That means that as consumers of the framework, there's less to learn. So you, once you're familiar with the Vite and you're familiar with the features that it provides, you can expect that those features will be available to you. Even if you move between different Vite frameworks, those features are going to be there and work the same way. Any plugins you've written for Vite are going to transfer between these uh, frameworks as well. And then the flip side of that is that as a maintainer of the framework, there's a lot less for you to maintain. There's a lot less uh, code for you to write. And uh, in our case, that means when we move from Remix to React Router, we can delete a lot of code. Uh, years of my life down the drain. But that's good. That's a good thing. Uh, and that's all thanks to Vite. Vite is a fantastic project. I've really enjoyed working on it. And uh, I really do want to thank the people that have, uh, like Evan Yu, of course, for starting it, and the, and the great team that's working around it now. Um, it's been a pleasure to work on top of. And if you're interested in building a framework, I highly recommend uh, trying your hand at building on top of Vite. So when it comes to the separation of frameworks versus libraries that we're drilling into today, as I said to you at the start, uh, I think the lines between libraries and frameworks are blurring, and hopefully I've convinced you of that fact. Uh, so much so that the next generation of frameworks might not be frameworks at all. That's it for me. Thank you so much for listening.